We're having a, a year-long commemoration of the anniversary of the beginning of the Vietnam War. And part of what we're doing is with this uh, literary series, that is, we've invited writers who in one way or another have uh, commented on that. And in trying to, you know, move past the, the I guess, conventional or expected types of events that you would uh, have with this. We have, we have events with veterans, we have events, uh, we just had a panel with veterans, uh, exhibits and so on, but we also want the other voices um, from that war and that came out of that war, um, including the voices of the people who came here who are allies and who came to this country after the war. Andrew Lam is the author of Perfume Dreams, Reflections on the Viet Vietnamese Diaspora, which won the 2006 Penn Open Book Award. East meets uh, West, East Eats Rest, <laughs> I can't speak this, I'm <laughs> sorry. East Eats West, you say that 10 times. Boy. Um, in two hemis writing in two hemispheres, he's an editor and a co-founder of New American Media, association of over 2,000 ethnic media outlets in America. He's a regular commentator on, on National Public Radio's All Thing Considered, and he has been the subject of a documentary called My Journey Home about going back to Vietnam. His essays are widely published um, and in, in many different magazines. And just, I think, last week, right, you were, uh, we just found out that Andrew won the Penn Oakland Literary Award, which will be presented in December, I believe. Congratulations. Um, the blurb about Andrew Lam's collection of short story, Birds of Paradise Lost, on the Amazon.com website states that his stories, quote, shimmer with humor, which is kind of a mixed metaphor or, you know, maybe because at my age, the letters in anything I try to read shimmer <laughs> and shake and, and blur and everything, you know. You know. But it's a fair enough description as far as it goes. Some of his stories are laugh out loud funny. One of my students after reading show and tell said, no, actually he shouted this in class. This is the best effing story I ever read. It's awesome. <laughs> well, I guess the story shimmered with humor for him. Uh, I would have liked to have seen his blurb on the, on the book actually. So. Um, Andrew's fiction allows that uh, awesome Necessity, that should be a word, it's not. It creates readers. We have less readers of good fiction than we ever had, and we need them. As a science fiction writer, Neil Gaiman says, literate people read fiction, and the simplest way to make sure we raise literate children is to teach them to read and to show them that reading is a pleasurable activity. And that means, at its simplest, finding books they enjoy, giving them access to those books, and letting them read them, books such as Andrew's. Guyman goes on that fiction has two uses. Firstly, it's a gateway drug to reading, the drive to know what happens next, to want to turn the page, the need to keep going even if it's hard because someone's in trouble and you have to know how it's going to end. That's a very real drive. And it forces you to learn new words, to think new thoughts, to keep going, to discover that reading per se is pleasurable. And the second thing fiction does is to build empathy. When you watch TV or you see a film, you're looking at things happening to other people. Prose fiction is something you build up from 26 letters and a handful of punctuation marks, and you and you alone use your imagination, create a world, and people it and look out through other eyes. You get to feel things, visit places and worlds you would never otherwise know. You learn that everyone else out there is the same as well. You're being someone else, and, what you re and when you return to your own world, you're going to be slightly changed, maybe even a lot changed. Empathy is a tool for building people into groups, for allowing us to function as more than self-obsessed individuals. Andrew Lam's fiction shimmers with empathy. Um, there's a poem I use in my uh, course by the Vietnamese American poet Lathe Ziem Thuy, who's, uh, who's been a guest writer here also. And part of the poem is this, I want, I tell you all this, 
to tear apart the silence of our days and nights here. I tell you all this to fill a void of absence in our history here. We are fragmented shards blown here by a war no one wants to remember in a foreign land. Let people know Vietnam is not a war. Let people know Vietnam is not a war. Let people know Vietnam is not a war, but a piece of us, and we are so much more. In the poem, she invites you to see not as yourself, as someone who hears the word Vietnam and so much associates it with war that you don't even need to tag that word onto it, but as someone from that country and culture, someone who knows that the history of her people, Vietnamese who are on the losing side of the war, on our side, and who fled afterwards, is as little known and regarded by other Americans as, as well, the war itself is not known. It is a war, as she says, no one wants to remember. Lam, by personalizing history, makes it personal, makes it a part of yourself. His stories are mirrors in which we recognize what Gaiman calls the me, and windows in which we see into other perceptions of the world. Lam writes, it has taken me a long time to come to the realization that for those whose lives have been inordinately altered by the forces of history, the personal is to the historical the way brooks and rivers are to the sea. What's he mean? He remembers something personal, his example, losing someone he loved, the breakup of a love affair, and the realization first that in losing that person, one loses a world, a language, a perception, a knitting pattern of behavior that the two of you share. And second, that those emotions were the same emotions he felt about losing his country, about losing Vietnam. The personal flows into the historical. This is what the function, the, excuse me, this is what the fiction of exile and of the aftermath of war does. He writes, for example, of a Vietnamese woman who meets the American veter veteran who killed her husband, but who finally must choose whether to take her revenge against him or to forgive him. A personal story, but again, one which evokes the historical and the universal question of how we must learn to live after war. It evokes the quote by Nelson Mandela when he was finally released from jail and said, as I walked toward my freedom, I knew if I did not leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. He writes of a Vietnamese boy who comes to America as a refugee, whose father was imprisoned and then killed by the Viet Cong, who lost his country, and who finds himself in a class with American kids whose language he does not speak who look at him as strange, who even call him a Viet Cong because he's Vietnamese and they do not know in the void of silence of his history here that he came fleeing the Viet Cong. For him to be part of them, he has to tell them his story, which he finally manages to do by finding a friend to help him to do so. One boy, a personal story, a personalized story of the whole history of the Vietnamese diaspora in America, losing their country coming to a country which does not want to know their history, coming to a country where what are needed are storytellers like Andrew Lam to tell their stories so they can weave into and become a part of our stories. Yep. Andrew Lam. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me here. I'm, I'm in awe that there's standing room, I mean, then standing people, because uh, that never happened before. <laughs> so thank you for coming tonight. Um, well, I'm going to read a little segment from Perfume Dreams as uh, part of my autobiographical narrative uh, to give you a different idea of my own story before I get into reading a short story. Um, so we'll go with that first. On April 28, 1975, two days before Saigon fell to the Communist Army and the Vietnam War ended, my family and I boarded a cargo plane full of panicked refugees and headed for Guam. I remember watching Vietnam recede into the cloudy horizon from the plane's window, a green mass of land giving way to a hazy green sea. I was 11 years old. I was confused, frightened, and from all available evidence, the khaki army tents in the Guam refugee camp, the scorching heat, the long lines for food rations, the fetid odor of the communal latrines, I was also homeless. 
places and times when they can no longer be retrieved tend to turn sacrosanct. Home forever lost is forever based in a certain twilight glow. Even after many years in America, my mother still longed for the ancestral altar on which grandpa's faded black and white photo stared out into our abandoned home. She missed the carved rosewood cabinet in which she kept the enamel cover family albums and my father's special French wines from Bordeaux. She fretted over the small farm we owned near the Binlai Bridge on the outskirts of Saigon where the chickens roamed freely and the mangosteen and guava trees were heavy with fruits when we last visited and where the river dotted with water hyacinth ran swift and strong. This is a time of year when the guavas back home are ripened, mother would tell the family at dinner time. So far from home, mother nevertheless took her reference points in autumn, her favorite season. Autumn, the dark season, came in the form of letters she received from relatives and friends left behind, brown and flimsy, thin like dead leaves, recycled who knows how many times the letters threatened to dissolve with a single tear. They unanimously told of tragic lives. Auntie and her family barely survived. Cousin is caught for the umpteen time trying to escape. Uncle has died from a heart failure while is being interrogated by the Viet Cong. Yet another uncle is indefinitely incarcerated in a malaria-infested re-education camp. And no news yet of cousin and family who disappeared in the South China Sea. The letters went on to inquire as to our health then to timidly ask for money, for antibiotics, for a bicycle, and if possible, for sponsorship to America. The letters confirmed what my mother, who had lived through two wars, had always known. Life is a sea of suffering, and sorrow gives meaning to life. Then, as if to anchor me in old world tragedy, as if to bind me to that shared narrative of loss and misery, Mothers insisted that I, too, read those letters. What did I do? I skimmed. I skipped. I shrugged. I put on a poker face and raked autumn in a pile and pushed it all back to her. That country, I slowly announced in English as if to wound, is cursed. That country, mind you, no longer mine. Vietnam was now so far away an abstraction, and America was now so near a seduction. Besides, what could a scrawny refugee teenager living in America do to save uncle from that malaria-infested re-education camp? What could he do for cousin and her family lost somewhere in the vast South China Sea? He could, on the other hand, pretend amnesia to save himself from grief. My mother made the clucking sounds of disapproval with her tongue as she shook her head. She looked into my eyes and called me the worst thing she could muster. You've become a little American now, haven't you? A cowboy. Vietnamese appropriated the word cowboy from the movies to imply selfishness. A cowboy in Vietnamese estimation is a rebel who, as in the spaghetti westerns, leaves town, the communal life, to ride alone into the sunset. Mother's comment smarted, but she wasn't far from the truth. Her grievances against America had little to do with the war and the United States' involvement in it. Her complaints against America was that it had stolen her children, especially her youngest and once most filial son. America seduced him with its optimism, twisted his thinking, bent his tongue, and dulled his tropic memories. America gave him freeways and fast food and silly cartoons and sitcoms, imbuing him with sappy, happy ending incitements. Yet it could not be helped. For the refugee child in America, the world splits perversely into two irreconcilable parts, inside and outside. Inside at home, in the crowded apartment shared by two refugee families, nostalgia ruled. Inside, the world remained dedicated to what was. Remember the house we used to live in with the red bougainvillea wavering over the iron gate? Remember when we went to Hue and sailed down the perfumed river for the night market, and that night the sky was full of stars? Inside, the smell of fish sauce wafted along with the smell of incense from the newly built altar that housed photos of the dead, a complex smell of loss. 
Inside, the refugee father told and retold wartime stories to his increasingly disaffected children, reliving the battles he had fought and won. He stirred his whiskey and soda on ice, then stared blankly at the TV. Inside, the refugee mother grieved for lost relatives, lost home and hearth, lost ways of life, a whole cherished world of intimate connections, scattered and uprooted, gone, gone, all gone. And so inside I, their refugee child, felt the collected weight of history on my shoulders and fell silent. Outside, however, what do you want to be when you grow up, Mr. K, the English teacher in eighth grade asked. I had never thought of the question before, such an American question, but it intrigued me. I did not hesitate. A movie star, I answered laughing. Outside, I was ready to believe, to swear that the Vietnamese child who grew up in that terrible war and who saw many strange, tragic, and marvelous things was someone else, not me. That it had happened in another age, centuries ago. That Vietnamese boy never grew up. He wandered still in the garden of my childhood memory. Whereas I, I had gone on at night. It was a feeling that I could not help. I came to America at a peculiar age, pubescent and not fully formed, old enough to remember Vietnam. I was also young enough to embrace America and to be shaped by it. Outside in school, among new friends, I spoke English freely and deliberately. I whispered sweet compliments to Chinese and Filipino girls and made them blush. I cussed and joked with friends and made them laugh. I bantered and cavorted with teachers and made myself their pet. Speaking English, I had a markedly different personality than when speaking Vietnamese. In English, I was a sunny, upbeat, silly, and sometimes wickedly sharp-tongued kid. No sorrow, no sadness, no cataclysmic grief clung to my new language. A wild river full of possibilities flowed effortlessly from my tongue, connecting me to the new world, and I, Enamored by the discovery of a newly invented self, I sailed its iridescent waters towards spring. Thanks. So, since we talk about show and tell so much, I figure I read that since a lot of students came up today and said that was their favorite story. And I think it's fun to read out the piece uh, that people have read uh, on their own to see how different it might be. Um, plus, I get to swear a lot. <laughs> Show and tell. And by the way, Mr. K is the only character that goes in fiction. Uh, he's like a teacher that uh, I had when I was young. He's my first English teacher. And he shows up in my fiction, surprisingly, almost as if he belonged there. So. Mr. K brought in the new kid near the end of the semester during what he called oral presentations and everybody else called seventh grade show and tell. This is Kowloon Din, he said, and he's from Vietnam, and immediately me and old Billy say, cool. What's so cool about that, Kevin? Who sat behind him asked, and Billy said, idiot, don't you know anything? That's where my dad came back from with this big old scar on his chest and a bunch of grossed out stories. And that's where they have helicopters and guns and VCs and all this crazy shit. <laughs> Billy would have gone on, but Mr. K said, be quiet, Billy. Mr. K stood behind the new kid and drummed his fingers on the kid's skinny shoulders like they were little flapping wings. He tried to be nice to the new kid, I could tell, but the kid looked nervous anyway. The way he hugged his green backpack, you'd think it was a lifesaver. Cao Long Din is a Vietnamese refugee, Mr. K said, and he turned around and wrote, Cao Long Din, refugee, in blue on the blackboard. Cao doesn't speak any English yet, but he'll learn soon enough, so let's welcome him, shall we? And we all did, we all applauded. Me and old Billy, though, decided to boo him just for the hell of it, and Kevin and a few others started to laugh, and the new kid blushed like a little girl. When we were done applauding and booing, Mr. K gave him a seat in front of me, and he sat down without saying hello to anybody, not even to me, his neighbor, and I had gone out of my way to flash him a smile. But right away, I started to smell this nice smell from him. It reminded me of eucalyptus or something. I was going to ask him what it was, but the new kid took out his Hello Kitty notebook 
and began to draw in it like he'd been doing it forever, drawing and scrawling and paying no mind to anyone when even when show and tell already started and it was, I'm sorry to say, my turn. Tell you the truth, I didn't want it to be my turn. I can't be funny and all, but I hated being in front of the class as much as I hated anything. But what can you do? You go up when it's your turn, that's what. So when Mr. K called my name, I brought my family tree chart and taped it on the blackboard under where Mr. K wrote, Khao Long Din Refugee. And be, but before I even started, Billy say, Bobby, so poor, you only got half a tree. And everybody laughed. I wanted to say something back real bad right then and there. But as usual, I held my tongue because I was a little afraid of Billy. OK, I like more than a little afraid. But if I weren't so fearful of that big, dumb ox, I could have said a bunch of things like, well, at least I have half a tree. Some people that only have sorry-ass warmongers for big, with big old scars for her daddy. <laughs> or I could say, what's wrong with half a tree is much better than having shit for brains. <laughs> or something like that. Anyway, not everybody laughed at Billy's butt wipe of a comment. Mr. K, he, for instance, he didn't laugh. He looked sad, in fact, shaking his head like he was giving up on Billy, saying, shh, Billy, how many times do I have to tell you to be quiet in my class? And the new kid, he didn't laugh neither. He just stared at my tree like he was trying to figure out what it was. But when he saw me looking at him, he blushed and pretended like he was busy drawing. I knew he wasn't. He was curious about my drawing, my sorry excuse of a family tree. If you want to know the awful truth, it's only half a tree because my mama wouldn't tell me about the other half. Your daddy was a jackass, she said. And so is his entire family. <laughs> That's all she said. But mama, I say, it's for my oral presentation. And it's important. But she say, so what? So nothing, that's what. So my daddy hangs alone on this little branch on the left side. He left when I was four, so I don't remember him very well. All I remember is that he was real big and handsome. I remember him hugging and kissing and reading me a bedtime story once or twice, and then he was gone. Only my sister, Charlene, remembers him well on account of Charlene being three years older than me. She remembered us having a nice house when my daddy was still around and mama didn't have to work. And she remembers a lot of fighting and yelling and flying dishes and broken vases and stuff like that. One night, the battle between mama and daddy got so bad that Charlene said she found me hiding in the closet under a bunch of mama's clothes with my eyes closed and my hands over my ear saying, stop, please, stop, please, stop, like I was singing or chanting or something. I don't remember any of that stuff. It just feels like my entire life is spent living in this crummy apartment at the edge of the city, and Mama has been working at Max's diner forever. So what did I do? I started out with a lie. I had rehearsed the whole night for it. I say, my daddy's dead. Dead from a car accident a long, long time ago. I say he was an orphan, so that's why there's only half a tree, so fuck you, Billy. <laughs> then I started on the other half. I know the other half real well because all my mama's relatives are crazy or suicidal. <laughs> there was, for example, my great-great-granddaddy Charles Boyle III, who was this rich man in New Orleans, who had 10 children in a big old plantation during the Civil War. Too bad he supported the wrong side because he lost everything and killed himself after the war ended. Then there was my granddaddy, Jonathan Quentin, who became a millionaire from owning a gold mine in Mexico, and then he lost it all in alcohol and gambling, and then he killed himself. And there was my grandma, Mary, who was a sweetheart, who had three children and who killed herself before the bone cancer got to her. And there was a bunch of cousins who went north and east and west, and they became pilots and doctors and lawyers, and maybe some of them killed themselves too. And I wouldn't be surprised a bit if they did, because Mama said it's kind of like a family curse or something. I went on like that for some time, going through the dozen lies before I got to the best part. See here, that's where my, that's my great aunt Jenny Ann Quentin, all alone in this little branch because she's an old maid. 
She's still alive too, 97 years old and with only half a mind. And she lives in this broken down mansion outside of New Orleans and she wears old tattered clothes and talks to ghosts and curses them Yankees for winning the war. I saw her once when I was young. Great Aunt Jenny scared the hell out of me because she had a big old shotgun and everything. And she didn't pay her electric bill, so her big old house is always dark and scary and haunted. If you stay overnight there, the Confederate ghost will pull your legs and rearrange your furniture or worse still, your underwear. <laughs> so in summary, had we won the war 100 years ago, we might have all stayed in the South. But as it is, my family tree has at least fallen all over the state. So that's it. Now I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Tommy went after me. He told about stamp collecting, and he brought three albums for pretty stamps. Stamps 100 years old, and stamps as far as the Vatican and Sri Lanka. He told how hard it was for him to have a complete collection of Pope John Paul II. And then it was Cindy's turn. She talked about embroidery, and she brought with her two pillowcases made with pictures of playing pandas and dolphins that she herself embroidered. She even showed us how she stitches and what each stitch is called, and how rewarding it was to get the whole thing together. And Kevin talked about building a tree house with his dad and how fun it was. He even showed us the blueprints that he and his daddy designed together and photos of himself hanging out on a tree house, waving and swinging from the rope like a monkey with his friends. And it looked like a great place to hide to if you're pissed off at your mama or something like that. And then the bell rang. <laughs> Robert, Mr. K say, I wonder if you'd be so kind as to take care of a new student and show him the cafeteria. Why me? I asked and made a face like when I had to take the garbage out at home when it wasn't even my turn. But Mr. K said, why not you, Robert? You're a nice one. Oh, no, I'm not, I said. <laughs> oh, yes, you are, he said, and wiggled his bushy eyebrows up and down like Groucho Marx. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> okay, I said, but just today, okay? Though I kind of wanted to talk to the new kid anyway, and Mr. K said, thank you, Robert Quentin Mitchell. He called the new kid over and put one arm around his shoulders and the other around mine. Then he said, Robert, this is Cow. Cow, this is Robert. Robert will take care of you. You both can bring your lunch back here and eat if you want. We're going to have a speed tournament today, and there's a new X-Men comic book for the winner. All right, I said. You're privileged if you get to eat lunch in Mr. K's room. Mr. K has all these games he keeps in the cabinet, and at lunchtime, it's sort of like a club and everything. You can eat there if A, you're a straight A student, B, if Mr. K likes and invites you, which is not often, or C, if you're you know for sure you're going to get jumped that day if you play outside and you beg Mr. K really, really hard to let you stay. <laughs> I'm somewhere in between the B and C category. <laughs> if you're a bad egg like Billy, who is single-handedly <laughs> responsible for my C situation, you ain't never going to get in, to eat there and play games, that's for sure. So, Cal Din Refugee, I said, Let's go grab lunch, then we'll come back here for the speed tournament, what do you say? But the new kid said nothing. He just stared at me and blinked like I'm some kind of strange animal that he ain't never seen before or some. Come on, I say, and waved him toward me. Come on, follow me. The line's getting longer by the suck. And so finally, he did. We stood in line with nothing to do, so I asked him, Hey, cow, where'd you get them funny shoes? No understand, he said, and smiled. No speak English. Shoes, I said. Bata, bata. And I pointed, and he looked down. Oh, shoes, he said, and his eyes shining black and wide open like he just found out for the first time that he was wearing shoes. <laughs> shoes, Saigon. Yeah, I say. I guess I can buy me some here in the good old USA then, huh? Mine's Adidas. They're as old as Mrs. Hamilton, prehistoric, if you ask me. <laughs> but they're still Adidas. Adidas. Go ahead, Cal, say it. 
Adidasus, Cow said. Adidas. That's right, I say. Very good, Cow. Adidas shoes and yours, they're bata shoes. And Cow say, they're bata shoes. And we both looked at each other and grinned like idiots, and that's when Billy showed up. <laughs> Why you want them gook shoes anyway, he said, and cut in between us. But nobody in line say nothing, because it's Billy. Why not, I say, trying to sound tough. Bata sounds kind of nice, Billy. They're from Saigon. Bata, Sus, the new kid said again, trying to impress Billy. But Billy wasn't impressed. My daddy said them VCs don't wear shoes, he said. They wear sandals made of Jeep tires, and they live in fucking tunnels like moles. And they eat bucks and snakes for lunch. Then afterwards, they go up and take sniper shots at you with their AK-47s. He don't look like he look in no tunnel. He live in no tunnel, I said. Maybe not him, said Billy, but his daddy, I'm sure. Isn't that right, refugee boy? Your daddy a VC? Your daddy the one that gave my daddy that goddamn scar? The new kid didn't say nothing. You could tell he pretty much figured it out that Billy's an asshole because you don't need no English for that. <laughs> But all he could say was, no understand, and Sus Adidas. And those ain't no comeback lines, and he knew it. <laughs> so he just bit his lip and blushed and kept looking at me with them eyes. So I don't know why. Maybe because I didn't want him to know that I belong to the C category. Or maybe because he kept looking at me with those eyes. But I said, leave him alone, Billy. I was kind of surprised that I said it. And Billy turned and looked at me like he was shocked too. Like he just saw me for the first time or something. Then in this loud sing song voice, he say, Bobby's protecting his new boyfriend. Everybody look, Bobby's got a boyfriend. He's going to suck his VC's dick after lunch. Oh. <laughs> Everybody started to look. The new kid kept looking at me like he was waiting to see what I was going to do next. What I usually do next is shut my trap and pretend that I was invisible or try not to cry. Like last time when Billy got me in a headlock and in the locker room and called me sissy over and over because I missed a softball at PE, even when it was an easy catch. But not now. Now I couldn't pretend to be invisible because too many people were looking. It was like I didn't have a choice. It was like now or never, so I said. You know what, Billy, don't mind if I do. I'm sure anything is bigger than yours. <laughs> then everybody in line say, oh. <laughs> well, fuck you, you little faggot, Billy said. <laughs> no thanks, Billy, I say. I already got me a new boyfriend, remember? <laughs> everybody say, ooh, and again, and Billy looked real mad. Then I got more scared than mad, my blood pumping. I thought, oh my god, what have I done? I'm going to get my lights punched out for sure. But then God delivers stupid Becky. She suddenly stuck her big in and said, he's cute too, almost as cute as you, Bobby, a blonde and a brunette. You two make a nice faggot couple, I'm sure. Like, promise me you name your firstborn after me, OK? <laughs> so like, I tore at her. That girl could never jump me. Not in a zillion years. I'm sure you're a slut, I said. <laughs> I'm sure you get down with anything that moves. I'm sure there are litters of stray mutts already named after you. You know, bitch Becky one, bitch Becky two, and let's not forget Bow Wow Becky Jr. <laughs> and Becky say, asshole, and looked away. And everybody cracked up, even me, no Billy. Man, he says, shaking his head, you got some mean mouth on you today. <laughs> and it was like suddenly I was too funny or famous for him to beat up. After that, he bought his burger and chocolate meal, and he said real loud so everybody can hear. He said, I'll see you two bitches outside later. <laughs> sure, Billy, I say, and wave to him. See ya later. And then after we grab our lunch, the new kid and me, we made a beeline for Mr. K's. Boy, it was good to be in Mr. K's, I tell you. 
You don't have to watch over your shoulder every other second. You can play whatever game you want, or you can read or just talk. So we ate, and afterward, I showed the new kid how to play speed. He was a quick learner, too, if you ask me, but he lost pretty early on in the tournament. Then I lost, too, pretty damn quickly after him. So we sat around and flipped through the X-Men comic book and tried to explain to the new kid why Wolverine is so cool because he can heal himself with his mutant factor, and he had claws that cut through metal. And Phoenix, she's my favorite. Phoenix so cool because she can talk to you psychically and she knows how everybody feels without even having to ask them. <laughs> and best of all, she can lift an 18-wheeler with her psychokinetic energy. That's way cool, don't you think, Hal? The new kid, he listened and nodded to everything. I said like he understood. Anyway, after a while, there were more losers than winners, and the losers surrounded us and interrogated the new kid like he was a POW or something. You ever shoot anybody, Kao Long? Did you see anybody get killed? Say, Long, how long have you been here? Long, ha, ha, ha. I hear they eat dogs over there. Is that true, Long? Have you ever eaten a dog? Have you ever seen a helicopter blown up like in the movies? No understand. The new kid answered to each question and smiled or shook his head or waved his hand like shooing flies. But the loser flies wouldn't shoo. I mean, where else could they go? Mr. Case was it. So the new kid looked at me again with them eyes and I say, Okay, okay, cow, I'll teach you something new. Why don't you say, hey, fuckheads, leave me alone. <laughs> Go ahead, cow, say it. <laughs> e fuckheads, he said, looking at me. Leave me alone. I say, looking at him, leave me alone. The, he said, hey, fuckheads, leave me alone. And everybody laughed. I guess that was the first time they got called fuckheads and actually felt good about it. But Mr. K say, Robert Quentin Mitchell, you watch your mouth or you never come in here again. But you could tell he was trying not to laugh himself. So I say, okay, Mr. K. But I leaned over and whispered, hey, fuck it, leave me alone. And the new, in the new kid's ear, so he remember, and he looked at me like I'm the coolest guy in the world. I, after school, he, when I was waiting for my bus, the new kid found me. He gave me a folded piece of paper, and before I could say anything, he blushed and ran away. You never guess what it was. It was a drawing of me, and it was really, really good. I was smiling in it. I looked real happy and older, like a sophomore or something. Not this sixth grade year book picture where I looked so goofy with my eyes closed and everything that I had to sign my name over it so people wouldn't look. When I got home, I taped it on my family tree chart and pinned it on uh, the chart on my bedroom door, and I swear the whole room had this vague eucalyptus smell. Then the next day, at show and tell, Billy made the new kid cry. He went after Jimmy. Jimmy was this total nerd with thick glasses who told us how very challenging it was to do the New York Times crossword puzzle because you would have to know words like ubiquitous, and undulate and capricious, totally lame and bogus stuff like that. When he took so long just to do five across and seven horizontal, we shot spitballs at him. And Mr. K said, stop that. But we got rid of that capricious, undulating bozo ubiquitously fast. <laughs> and that was when Billy came up and made the new kid cry. He brought in his daddy's army uniform <coughs> and a stack of old magazines. He unfolded the uniform with the name Baxter sold under US Army and put it on the chair. Then he opened one magazine and showed a picture of this naked and bleeding little girl running and crying on this road while these houses behind her were on fire. That's napalm, he said, and it eats into your skin and burns for a long time. This girl, Billy said, she got burned real bad, see? Then he showed another picture of this monk sitting cross-legged, and he was on fire and er everything. And there were people standing behind him crying, but nobody tried to put the poor man out. 
That's what you call self-immolation, Billy say. They do that all the time in Nam. This man, he poured gasoline on himself and lit a match because he didn't like the government. Then Billy showed another picture of dead people in black pajamas along this road, and he said, these are VCs, and my dad got at least half a dozen before he himself was wounded. My dad told me if it weren't for them beatniks and hippies, we could have won. And that's when the new kid buried his face in his arms and cried. And I could see his skinny shoulders go up and down like waves. That's enough, Billy Baxter, Mr. K said. Can you sit down now, thank you? Oh, man, Billy said. I didn't even get to the part about how my daddy got his scar. That's the best part. Never mind, Mr. K said. Sit down. I'm not sure whether you understood the assignment, but you were supposed to do an oral presentation on what you've done or something that has to do with you, a hobby, a personal project, not the atrocities in Indochina. Then Mr. K looked at the new kid like he didn't know what to do. That war, he said, I swear. After that, it got real quiet in the room and all you could hear was the new kid sobbing. Cow, Mr. K said finally, real quiet like, like he didn't want to bother him. Cow, are you all right, Cow Long Din? The new kid didn't answer, Mr. K, so I put my hand on his shoulder and shook a little. Hey, Cow, I say, you okay? Then it was like I pressed an on button or something because all of a sudden, Cow raised his head and stood up. He looked at me, and then he looked at the blackboard. He looked at me again, then the blackboard. Then he marched right up there, even though it was Roger's turn next, and Roger, he already brought his two pets next and everything. But Cal didn't care. Maybe he thought it was his turn because Mr. K called his name. And so he just grabbed a bunch of collar chalks and on Mr. K's desk and started to draw like a wild man. And Mr. K, he let him. We all stared. He was really, really good. But I guess I already knew that. First, he drew a picture of a boy sitting on a water buffalo, and then he drew this rice field in green. Then he drew another boy on another water buffalo, and then they seemed to be racing. He drew other kids running along the bank with their kites in the sky, and you could tell they were laughing and yelling, having a good time. Then he started to draw little houses on both sides of this river, and this river ran toward the ocean, and the ocean had big old waves. Cow drew a couple standing outside this very nice house holding hands, and underneath them he wrote, Ba and Ma. Then he turned and looked straight at me, his eyes still wet with tears. Robert, he said, tapping the pictures with his chalk. His voice sad but expecting. Robert. Me, I said. I felt kind of dizzy. Everybody was looking back and forth between him and me like we were tossing a softball between us or something. Robert, Cal said my name again and kept looking at me until I, I said, what, what, what do you want, Cal? Cal tapped the blackboard with his chalk again, and I saw in my head the picture of myself taped on my family tree. And then I don't know how, but I just kind of knew. So I just took a deep breath, and then I said, OK, OK, Cal said that um, he used to live in this village with his family, his mama and papa near the river where it runs into the sea. And Cal nodded and smiled and waved his chalk in a circle like he was saying, go on, Robert Quentin Mitchell, you're doing fine. Go on. And so I went on. And he went on. I talked. He drew. We fell into a rhythm. He had a good time racing them water buffaloes with his friends and flying kites, I say. And his village is all nice. And at night, he goes to sleep swinging on this hammock and hearing the sound of the ocean and everything. Then one day, I say, the soldiers came with guns and they took his daddy away. They put him behind barbed wires with other men, all skinny and hungry, and they got chains on their ankles, and they looked real sad. 
cow and his mother went to visit, and they stood on the other side and cried a lot. Then he died, and cow and his mother buried him in the cemetery with lots of grace, and they lit candles and cried and cried. And after that, there was this boat, I guess, this real crowded boat, and cow and his mama climbed on it, and they went down the river and out to sea. Then they got on this island, and they got on this airplane, and after that, they came here to live in America. Cow was running out of space. He drew the map of America way too big, but he didn't want to erase it. So he climbed on a chair and drew these high rises right above the rice fields. And I recognized the Trans-America building right away, a skinny pyramid underneath a rising moon. Then he drew a big old heart around it. Then he went back to the scene where the man named Ba, who stood in the doorway with his wife, and he drew a heart around him. Then he went back to the first scene of the two boys racing on the water buffaloes in the rice field and paused a little before he drew tiny tennis shoes on the boys' feet. And paused <laughs> and on the boys' feet, and I heard Billy said, that's Bobby and his refugee boyfriend, but I ignored him. Cal loves America very much, especially San Francisco, I said. He never seen so many tall buildings before in his whole life, and they're so pretty. Maybe he'll live with his mother someday up in the penthouse when they have lots of money. But he missed home too, and he misses his friends, and he especially misses his daddy who died a lot. And that's all. I think he's done. Thank you. And he was done. Cal turned around and climbed down from the chair. And he looked at everybody and checked out their faces to see if they understood. Then in this real loud voice, he said, hey, fuckheads, leave me alone, <laughs> and bowed to them. And everybody cracked up and applauded. <laughs> Cal started walking back. He was smiling and looking straight at me like he was saying, Robert Quentin Mitchell, ain't we a team or what? <laughs> and I wanted to say, yes, yes, Kowloon Din refugee, yes, we are. But I just didn't say anything. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs>